live. Your stream has ended. You're no longer live. Well, all right, try that again. <laughs> Stop. Small session. <laughs> Stop now. Stop streaming. No, it looks like we are live. Okay. Okay. All right. So welcome, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you to the Harassus uh, panel session today on systemic uh, complexity and um, how systemic complexity um, might be obscuring de development pathways. In other words, in simple terms, how do we better see the future? How do we predict better uh, the directions that we're going uh, as a society, as businesses, as politicians? Um, I'm John Cook. I'm based in Zurich, and um, I've had the pleasure of joining um, probably 20 of these Harasses sessions since he launched the since Frank la launched the the Harasses platform. Um, it's um, it's a pleasure to be out among some, so many uh, experienced professionals from around the world. And I don't know if you might have seen that earlier today, Frank. Um, hosted or put together a special session on Ukraine, where he had uh, quite a few uh, um, speakers from the Ukrainian parliament. I tried to dial into it, but I was uh, actually off time. I thought it was an hour later, so I, I missed it, but I'll hear it in, on, the, uh, on the replay. I'd like to uh, introduce our panels, panelists today um, and ask each of them to self-introduce themselves for two or three minutes. Um, I've known everybody for some time here, and uh, we have a very highly qualified panel. We're missing one person who is Luigi um, Cavalito in Lebanon. He will join us as he can. But in the meantime, um, Sushil, could you start off with your background and introduce yourself? You're on mute. I think you're on mute. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for inviting me on the panel. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Sushil. I, I grew up in India, uh, moved to the United States in 2002, uh, did my master's, uh, worked at Microsoft, uh, and then was part of an elite team of, of uh, uh, engineers at Microsoft who built new billion dollar products. In my seven years at Microsoft, I, I built three different billion dollar products along with my team. Uh, after that, I started three startups. Uh, one of them did very well. One of them did all right. And I'm on to my third one now. And the learning I have from Silicon Valley is uh, is very is probably similar to the question here, which is how do you address systemic complexity where it doesn't become hindrance to any decision making or future growth? And, and uh, in my opinion, startups have very similar problem when you try to solve a problem with very little resources, very little knowledge of the domain, uh, and you have to make progress against the tide and and uh, be profitable in a due course of time and create value. Right? So I would love to share some of my learnings as startup entrepreneur and uh, and try to draw parallels between you know how you could solve it in real life for systemic problems. Uh, my current startup is in travel. Uh, we, you might know that uh, travel at airports has become, if you if you consider COVID or even before COVID, has become very uh, uh, anxiety driven, very tedious. Where the airports have become longer, there are too many security lines. Uh, you always think if you're going to miss your flight. So what we have created is for global airports. We have created an, an airport assistant, which helps you track your flight, helps you get to your gate on time, order food, order duty free, uh, order fast track security, pay for parking, all from your mobile app. Uh, so uh, basically what you have is the airport information desk in your palm. It is in your pocket, anywhere you're going, it's with you and it's helping you have a, a premium experience, an anxiety free experience at the airport. Especially in COVID, uh, the context uh, has become even more relevant in addition to revenue. And the context has been that passengers are now looking to have a contactless experience, a touchless experience at the airport. They don't want to come in, in touch or proximity of airport staff or sales staff. So with the mobile app or mobile marketplace like ours, 
you could uh, browse the product and services ahead of time order and have it delivered to the gate or have it delivered to your lounge before you take off um so that's what i do um uh, yeah and happy to be on this panel and looking forward to interacting with all of you guys great thank you thanks to shil uh technology guy um so great to have you with us roy dr herberger would you share your background and uh and uh Give us some thoughts about what who you are and what you're thinking. Well, thank you very much, John. It's not good to be with the panel and with the, this large scale education network uh, that they have arrived for us. Uh, I had a, a real simple upbringing, but it shapes the kind of areas of expertise that uh, I've enjoyed. Uh, I grew up in the oil fields of West Texas. Um, and uh, spent time on uh, oil and gas and in the middle of some uh, not so uh, so much uh, hostile environments uh, there. But it gave me a good background in terms of the importance of oil and gas. And I ended up with a bank uh, uh, for a while. They put me through school uh, as uh, working in the petroleum land departments and understanding, again, the financial parts of, uh, of energy. From that... Uh, while I was in school, I, I needed some money, and I ended up uh, grading papers for a faculty member, and that ended up putting me actually in the classroom teaching in corporate communications, and that led to uh, going on to uh, my doctoral and master's studies in marketing as well as in uh, business in general. From that, uh, I uh, moved to the University of Southern California uh, and taught there and ended up in the management side of uh, of that school uh, as the vice dean for USC Business School. And the, the wonderful thing about USC was where it was located, L.A. L.A. was, uh, to me, the, it was like a birthplace of, of being involved in multiple activities, uh, uh, particularly the entertainment industry. I worked with Playboy Productions and worked with their planning and marketing as they uh, moved uh, their record divisions up out to California. Um, I also had the opportunity there to uh, start a couple of, of international programs uh, that were based uh, in markets in uh, Asia, primarily Japan, Southeast Asia, taught uh, there in, uh, at USC and also Latin America. Uh, I uh, stayed in the academic world, as dean of the business school at SMU in Dallas, and ended up as president of Thunderbird, the American Graduate School in, in uh, Arizona. Uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life was the fact that the same guy who was pumping oil in uh, Midland, Texas, was involved with an institution that was global in scope and, and nature. It was tremendous. So I, uh, my three things that I, I have focused on have been education, number one. I spent about 27 years in that area. And I've had the opportunities on boards uh, to, to really interact, one uh, in the nuclear power industry uh, and the other in medicine. So I spent about uh, almost 15, 13 years at, on the board of Mayo Clinic, uh, which is uh, based in Rochester, Minnesota. So those three areas, education, medicine, and uh, energy are the areas that I follow closely and, and I find the most interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That's a quite a journey you've gone from West Texas all around the world. <laughs> well, the passport to me meant going to the Red River in Oklahoma. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so uh, interesting. You, you and Sushil have something in common in the form of uh, U USC, right, uh, Sushil? Right. You're on mute, Sushil. Yeah. I I did my master's at USC in computer science. Yeah. That's small world. Great. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, Victor, you're sitting in your yeah. way. Can you yeah. share your can you share your background, please? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm based in Uruguay, South America. Um, I have a PhD in bioinformatics. Uh, that makes a little bit of what my initial great was in biology and bio um, engineering. Uh, 
but then I, I'm the CEO and founder of a company which makes software for um, capital markets. So my two um, places of interest are uh, softwares, uh, software development like Sushil, um, but life science in, uh, at the same time because I, I work a little bit in, in science also. Okay, great, great. Where's your PhD from? From the university here in Uruguay, Universidad de la Republica. Okay, great. So um, we're missing one other guy, um, uh, Luigi. In 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 um, in. Oh, here he is. He's just joined us. Hi, John. Luigi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, so happy to be here with you, and uh, my name is Vallito. I was born in Italy, but now I'm based in Lebanon, and uh, complexity is also in my DNA because I studied economics and music, and that are two things that are not really related to themselves. In the past, I've been involved in several different initiatives in the private and public sector, and uh, especially in the humanitarian field and social entrepreneurship, working with... Uh, organization like the Global Shapers Community, an initiative of the World Economic Forum, uh, or for organizing the Y7 or uh, uh, the Y20, that are the G7 and G20 of young people with young ambassador society. And now I'm active in Lebanon mainly on uh, trying uh, to shape uh, the social uh, economy and solidarity ecosystem uh, uh, facing interconnected crises on a daily basis because what happened uh, in this country and uh, in this area of the world in the last year, aside of the pandemic, uh, it was quite unique. Uh, and uh, so I'm very happy to discuss with uh, so much experienced people from around the world about complexity. And thank you, John, for uh, moderating this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Well, we have um, some interesting perspectives here. Um, we are going to, I wanted to um, sort of develop in each of your uh, areas of expertise um, or, or what you would like to select to talk on today. It doesn't have to be um, uh, the topic that, you're in, uh, that your background is in. One of the topics that I talked about in, my, in, our, in our planning session, uh, development pathways can be industrial development, education development, scientific, disease, medic med medical. Um, could you share with us, Roy, maybe you could kick off with a long 27 years in, in education. Um, the goal is to educate and the system, systemic complexities that you have found along the way in your journey to try to, do, to bring education to, to the world or to the students who are coming to you. What are the, what are the walls you have to overcome in the, in the education space? Well, if you look at uh, the history of education, it uh, joins the rank of uh, what they say are the two most unchanged professions. One of them is education. And the fact that, that we've been at this so long, you would think that we had reached some sort of perfection in terms of the outcomes of how education is conducted and, and how, it's, uh, how it has an impact on, on people. Uh, my observation is that we we are at some important hallmarks for education, particularly in the United States. There's some problems here that I've never seen before. For example, there is a um, uh, an exit and retirement of, any of the nation's university presidents from uh, schools that you would know, uh, retiring some for normal reasons like age. Others just simply retiring because of the difficulty of managing the educational process, particularly in the in the high schools, uh, particularly in elementary schools, <clears throat> as well as the colleges and universities, uh, makes the jobs not so uh, as romantic as they might have been at one point. Those things stem from changes uh, such as the political scene that has gotten involved in the outcomes, what should be taught, how it should be taught. Uh, diverse opinions about who is responsible for that. I would say that is one point of issue. The second thing has to do with the, the fact, how, how, how in the world could you come to this moment in time where 40, 45 million students collectively owe $1.7 trillion 
-hmm. for their education. And yet half of the United States population who have educations believe that their educations were insufficient. So you have a definition of, of a problem here that is relatively new, I think. But the facts are beginning to prove that there's something wrong with the system. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, other pieces of evidence I would use in education comes from the fact that you've got this separation of responsibilities, one from the instructors, one from the students as they try to achieve. And the third is from employers who decide whether or not to hire a person, one person or another. The third one, and I, again, I think from the technologists on the panel, is the failure of technology, the perceived failure of technology as it applies to education. Uh, they've got a lot of data, a lot of data, a lot of organizations and companies continually inventing to try to make education work better. And yet the outcomes from that, I, I just read a paper the other day where the consensus was the most successful technology application in the college classroom was the overhead projector and a faculty member who was competent. Uh, that's a stunning, stunning kind of conclusion, but it says that the tech, somehow or other technology and its applications simply hadn't delivered what you would hope. Another piece of evidence I, I guess I would point to is that if you take a company like Google, I know there's some experience on our panel about Google, you take HP, you take uh, General Motors. Many of these larger <clears throat> companies are now using very elaborate algorithms to test and to decide on how the best, what the best choices are for the employees or, or potential employees for their firms. And what they're seeing are a lot of skill bases, many of which are failures on the part of the educational system to really develop an individual employees. So when companies begin to use algorithmic kind of measurement for success parameters, and it backs into what actually is going on in the classrooms, you got a problem if it's not a, not a good match. But it is, I think, part of the rationale for why you see $1.7 trillion of, of money that's sitting there that did not have necessarily a good outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel very strongly that the interactions between politics, the interactions between the, uh, the students themselves. I, I use STEM education as an example of this. We know what's important, but the technology of, technologies have not been good enough to really deliver. And part of that is cost. But you're going to see and continue to see, I think, different formats for education pop up as a substitute for what was the holy un unbridled uh, uh, technologies and, and uh, values that were in every classroom from elementary schools to uh, the old German schools. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that, that that can change, but we have many more, many more uh, concerns about education today than we ever have in the past. And I think that's a real challenge for humanity. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So when you're speaking about that, I'm thinking about uh, what the big trend that I've seen in my lifetime, the, the decline of the U.S. education system and the rise of other education systems. And, you know, both being involved with Thunderbird, we've, we've seen that talent comes from everywhere. And in uh, places like India and China, uh, you know, they, uh, they're, I don't know if the American students coming out can compete with uh, the brains that are coming out of these these uh, other systems. And I just mentioned those two, but there's many, many others. So we have to upgrade a lot, if speaking from an American perspective, but thanks a lot for that. That, that outlines a lot of the big challenges that there are in education. Let's move over to um, Luigi. What are, well, in your development pathway, your focus in life is right now you've been in a lot of areas but sort of public public sector and and development social development and can you speak a bit to the systemic complexities that you have encountered on that journey yeah thanks john for the question and uh, let me say that uh, there is a lot of gray areas when we are thinking about complexity and especially in the humanitarian world 
And uh, what we are facing also in these days, because for example in Europe we say, oh, oh no, a uh, war knock on our doors, that is correct. But uh, all around the world, and even in Europe after the Second World War, there was uh, uh, an impressive and unfortunately like a war in the Balkans. Uh, we never have faced uh, like a solution to complexity. We try to eradicate it instead of embracing the idea that complexity is part of our society. And uh, Einstein was saying once that uh, I never think of the future, it comes soon enough. I think that right now we really understand uh, that we are all connected. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, just to go out of uh, what is the main challenge of this week, uh, five days ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, published uh, like uh, its latest report uh, saying that 3 billion people around the world are at risk because uh, the climate breakdown is happening faster than what we expected. So what uh, before was a humanitarian crisis, for example, because of war, now it's a climate crisis and there are other things I did. Now, uh, the job that I'm trying to do, and uh, not only me, of course, is not only to focus on emergency, but on sustainable development. Like there is a UN agenda on these, uh, the sustainable development goals, that is trying um, to give a lead on these. But uh, also we were talking uh, about the role of think tank and other like uh, potentially institutions that are helping authorities. Uh, and right now uh, it's pretty challenging because uh, some of these think tanks are not really elaborating some strategies for the future. So it's uh, all these things together, it, it put us on an action research on a daily basis uh, where uh, we know that the world cannot be understood without numbers, but the world cannot also be understood with numbers alone. So to have the people in mind, uh, I think uh, it's something that we need uh, uh, to consider as part uh, of the challenge that we're facing. And uh, we live in exponential times. What Roy says in education, uh, it's the same uh, in the problems of everyone around the world. So I was telling you, it's not anymore about the Middle East, it's not anymore about Eastern Europe, it's not anymore about uh, the Pacific or Africa and something else. And uh, maybe think tank as we know it uh, are becoming a little bit obsolete, but not to think. And uh, most probably what I'm seeing uh, is that we need uh, some do tank and not only think tank uh, that use reliable data and uh, also use dialogue uh, more than propaganda. And uh, in these days, I think that it's very important to focus there, so to maintain uh, this complexity and to work with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just trying to get the message uh, clear across the, the, the ages and the geographies uh, and um, uh, you, you mentioned bringing it's not only about the numbers, but the social aspect of it as well. The quality, the quali uh, quality as well as quantity that you're trying to, to highlight for the change that you're trying to bring. Yeah, let me say, for example, in business, now there is uh, uh, popping up a lot of uh, what we can uh, call B corporation that are not focused only on profit or only on shareholder, but they have a more a stakeholders mindset. And uh, we have these uh, components of social entrepreneurship uh, that uh, it's a kind of entrepreneurship with a soul, uh, just to define it uh, in a way that everyone can understand it. And it's interesting because if you talk with young people right now, they want to be social entrepreneurs, not only entrepreneurs. They don't want only to open a startup, they want to open a startup uh, that is uh, like uh, contributing to the greater social good. And yeah. uh, this complexity, it's interesting because there is no way of uh, now, to be honest, uh, on measuring the impact of these uh, social ventures, because we are still uh, in uh, the first phase uh, of this. So there is a lot uh, of uh, trial and error process uh, that it's part of the journey. And we have Victor here that uh, is a scientist, so he can uh, talk about the scientific approach even better than me, because trial and error, we thought that it was only for labs, but we are living uh, in a lab called uh, like Planet Earth. And uh, this is very important to remember every day that's that's interesting yeah, interesting way to look at it yeah we are we are living in, in, in the, the world is a lab we're all learning as we go right startups and 
a lot of people wanting to move uh, uh, away from the large corporations and into something where they can have an impact and start up, do their own startup and uh, and make, taking more risks. Uh, it, it's a very interesting time. So good segue over. Victor, do you want to talk a bit about yep. uh, the complexities that you find in trying to do your job? You said that you're now in, in software and, um, and also in um, biology. Exactly. And can yeah. you well, yeah what what I see as, as a whole there is that we're in the middle of a changing paradigm in many different areas from technology with AI blockchain to new forms of governance new forms of work new forms of power uh, data must be the goal in this new area uh, but when you're in the middle of a great change in paradigm the noise is loud and uh, looking ahead there always seems to be a thick fog that prevents us uh, from having even clues about what the, what the future may look like. Uh, in that sense, if we perceive a systematic complexity, uh, a more systematic complexity, maybe that something is happening in our, in our own big system, our world, our society, uh, with more intense rearrangement as it seeks to adapt into a new set of rules. So the good thing is regarding previsibility is that the fog will only last the time it takes, it takes for, for the paradigm to be shifted. So some lines are clear though, we are moving into a more connected world. We're moving into a more uh, environmentally friendly world and more shallow in discussion. Um, for example, Al Alessandro Varico, who's a, an Italian novelist said uh, in his book, uh, what we're looking for, that 21st century society compared to 20th century society is more shallow in the discussion uh, that we seek to bury today in today's society the culture of deep talking and this pandemic has devastated the, the depth in our discussion for sure so what, what i was trying to say that we we are some of our time uh, when we're trapped in, in a in a paradigm and by par paradigm let's just say it's a set of beliefs and rules it's very difficult to think as we have moved on and we are in the next paradigm but if by chance we can do, we are able to do so, we might be able to see the lines of the future through the fog. So um, let me tell you a, a, a little story um, that is beautifully depicted in a book called Dialogue Between a Philosopher and a, and a Physicist from Kino Canales. And this all happened a hundred years ago. And it was April 1922. And by that time, there was a debate between Albert Einstein uh, who was young at the time, and a philosopher named Henri Bergson. And they discussed about time. At no very good moment for Bergson, because Einstein was in his prime, trying to demonstrate the theory of relativity, and Bergson has spent his, his entire life arguing about what time was. Um, in that debate, Einstein was a winner, since the paradigm uh, that was beginning to be imposed uh, was a theory of real relativity, and what Bergson was saying was not understood. Uh, what happens is that 20 years later, the theory of quantum mechanics began to gain momentum, which in some way changed what Einstein said and gave reason to Bergson in such a way that it was said that Bergson anticipated the theory of quantum mechanics 20 or 30 years before it, it even existed. So. Um, we are some of, of, of the paradigms we are living. Standing in 1922, with the information we would have had at that time, we never think that Einstein wasn't right. So, um, talking about complexity uh, today, um, I, I'm looking about what's coming next. Next, I think uh, it needs to be said, just to set, to, to set a common ground that complex is not the same as complicated. Complicated refers to a high level of difficulty, but if a problem, a problem is complex, it's, it means that it has many components. So complexity does not call for difficulty. So what, what is a, a complex system then? Uh, a complex system is a collection of parts in a highly dependent network connected, but with no linear relationship among them. Uh, there is no clear relationship what, between cause and effect because an effect is caused by multiple interacting parts a way of seeing that is a butterfly effect, a flat of a butterfly in one corner of the world can cause a tornado in the other corner. There is a disproportionality between inputs and outputs. But here's the key element. The parts in the system have the ability to adapt, to evolve, and adapt to changes in the environment. 
So for me, the key element here is the element of adaptation, adapting, and that gives unpredictability to a system. For, as you may figure out, all non-linear non relationships in the system, they will be valid only for an instant as the elements may adapt and move somewhere else. So it, it, it is clear when you're forecasting, there's not the same for astrophysicists predicting a trajectory or an economist that will pre, uh, predict the, the, the price of oil. We have perfection our models and they will improve for you to know exactly when it's going to rain. That will certainly happen. But when it's a prediction in, econom in economics and in an economical model, it doesn't feel to fit as well. So why did it? Um, I think the key element that there is, is, is a human factor. When you add up humans interacting in your equation, then you get to the unpredictability zone. And the key uh, element for that is our adapting brain, our neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is, is, is the underlying process and refers to, to our brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experience. Uh, it's not that the brain only changes logically, it changes physically. So, so they, they ran an experiment in uh, using um, London taxi drivers, and they found out that they, they have a, pro a portion of, of, of their brain, a little portion that was uh, bigger than um, other people in the city. And that part of, of the brain is the part where, where you have the maps. So um, is human variable so unpredictable? If companies can predict what products are most likely to buy, uh, then why is it possible to be precisely predicted your behavior under a particular set of conditions? Remember that we're products of information that surround us. Uh, so I think it's easy to be trapped into thinking that if you can control the human variable, then your model for predicting trajectories might work as good as the one from the astrophysicist. Um, the companies that got all, gather all this big data are the ones that hold it for that like Facebook, Google. Um, but remember, no company can control all conditions around a person and cannot control adaptability. So the data from the past can talk a lot about preferences and about how, uh, about what might be the most probable move in, your, in, in a particular situation. But that doesn't mean you're actually going to do that. So using big data will improve our capacity to predict trajectories, it will for sure, but as for the near future, I think those predictions won't be accurate when they're human beings interacting in the formula. So, but, but talking about adaptability, one of the most impressive things, at least for me, um, during the, the, the last past uh, couple of years, uh, is that uh, our technology development has given us the ability to be more adaptable without even knowing it. Uh, during these last two years, we could learn from home communicate cheap and easy using video, get our food delivered to doors. That's, that all was uh, enabled by, by a technological development that wasn't meant for a pandemic, but worked perfectly in many ways. Our technological journey has made ourselves more adaptable, at least for, for this particular catastrophe. So at the end of the day, um, as Nassim Taleb says, um, and I agree with that. Don't worry too much about predicting and focus on preparations. Work out your adaptation and be prepared for the unexpected. Uh, and that may work not only for individuals, but also for uh, society as a whole. Interesting comments. Thanks a lot. I, I enjoyed that. That was good. I, you, you make me want to go back to school and study science and STEM. Uh, <laughs> Uh, very <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> and science and, and psychology and the brain, the human brain, and economics and the challenges we're facing. Um, you, need, you, know, you need a loan. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I think this is interesting. We should we should uh, we we should tell Frank we need another hour on our session here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a good segue over to my my friend Sushil, uh, who's in the on the technology journey for his third time and trying to predict where travel is going to be and what are the, what are the systemic complexities that you have faced i guess sushil on your on the uh, on the journey of entrepreneurship and technology entrepreneurship so i have uh, 
I have very little experience as compared to some of the other panelists on uh, I'm on the today's session. But I'll share what what I've learned a little bit, uh, and I'll give two examples. Uh, and the essence of that, and the essence of that uh, uh, of what I've learned. Uh, what I've learned is uh, in in so like let's take an example. So I worked at Microsoft for seven years. When Windows was started, when they started implementing it. The way they thought is IBM mainframe is so monolithic, it's so huge, it's so me, it's so tremendous to maintain. It's not worth it. It takes too much hardware. So we need to write operating system from scratch, which can run on a very thin hardware layer. Right? So they started writing. Uh, they got into MS DOS. They created first version of Windows, called it Windows 3.0. Probably in the first version of Windows, the graphical interface it was about you know three million lines of code. And and they rolled it. It was huge success, and a lot of feedback came in from the customer saying, "I need this. I need X. I need Paint. I need calculator. I need Microsoft Excel. I need it to remote login. I need more security." So they they added all of that. So their simplicity and their power against IBM was it was much more nimble and much more uh, lightweight. So in the next version, Microsoft Codebase, they launched Microsoft Windows 95. Uh, that was around you know eight million lines of code, and subsequent you know probably Windows. Uh, if we see Windows XP, which was the most successful Windows ever, that was around twenty one million lines of code. And and what they realized is the so till they got to Windows XP, it was iteratively more and more useful as the number of lines of code increased. The the software was getting more and more useful. But interesting thing happened after that. As they tried to add more features to Windows XP, the operating system started becoming slow. It started becoming buggy. It started becoming uh, very, uh, you know, it started requiring a lot more hardware. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the yep. same problem that it started against, which was IBM mainframes, Windows started having the same problems in its own code base. So the strength that Windows started with eventually over a period of time became its weakness, and and also led to the decline of of Windows Vista, which was the biggest flop, uh, you know, release of Microsoft Windows over a history of last fifty years at Microsoft, forty five years at Microsoft. That's when Microsoft decided that that it was not worth it to fix Windows Vista, and they and and uh, Bill Gates came out and Steve Ballmer came out and said. We will now write operating system from scratch again. It will take us five years, but we'll get there. But we'll do it right, and we'll again make it light. We'll again make it nimble. Right. So there's a lesson here. It it went from low to high to become useful, and then it dwindled down to an extent where it was not fixable, and you had to throw it away, and then you had to start from scratch. Right. Let's take an example of uh, of Facebook for that matter. Facebook started initially with only one motto, which was for me to connect with my Harvard uh, batchmates and to have communication with them and probably share pictures with them. From there, from that simple use case, it has now. If you look at the settings page on Facebook, I think there are hundred screens within the settings page itself. If you look at the number of groups and and posts and wall and stories and other things it has become offering, uh, it is now I think beyond I think the total number of features offered by Facebook is more than hundred. And interestingly, if you look at the adoption of Facebook and, and plotted against the number of features it had, to one point the number of the usage of Facebook keep on kept on growing, and after that. as the features increased the usage now started declining to an extent where now facebook has taken a call uh, some years back that they will now focus on instagram and instagram went from a, a very easy product a simple product a non complex product over 5 years became a complex product and now zuckerberg has come out mr zuckerberg has come out and he said the future of facebook is going to be meta the metaverse where again you will start very small from scratch and that will evolve into something meaningful and useful mm-hmm. i think there are observations there which is i think the biggest learning for me has been that it is cyclical the sim- the things which started simple over a period of time became complex 
the strength which they have eventually becomes their weakness and the same product basically fails or falls under its own weight it becomes so complex and our education system is a great example of that like uh, like you were mentioning earlier right uh, so we have to see okay are there any examples where a really complex pro- a product or a project which is evolved beyond complexity could really resurrect into meaningful and became simple again and useful again right and and try to learn from those examples and i think there are probably probably just one or two examples which at least come to my mind who were who were able to resurrect themselves from becoming overburdened and complex and to again becoming meaningful and, like and one of the examples like like yeah. coca cola like coca cola right they always kept it simple for that matter the example i want to give is steve jobs steve jobs uh, started his life where he was so passionate he started with one simple product of of uh, macintosh and it was hugely successful over a period of 7 years apple had i think 45 or 50 different products and none of them were successful all of them were failure to an extent where steve jobs had to kicked out of the company but he went and he went into isolation and he dwelled into what happened and and one way or the other and uh, over a period of time he again came back right like a phoenix he resurrected and he again started with simplicity he said apple will focus only on two products when he came back to apple after the acquisition of of disney pixar and then he said we'll focus only on two things and he simplified the complexity and he said what is meaningful in this and then he and apple today is the most valuable company in the world mm-hmm. uh, i think what i'm try the point i'm trying to make is uh your your simplicity your strengths will become your weakness it will become so complex it, there are very few examples that you can resurrect it but uh, uh but i think adaptation is one way but it's very very difficult to do it it's probably easier to throw it away and start with a brand new one right uh so as we are creating policies and we are looking out for ways for governments and education institutes to to make their complexities into something meaningful and simpler i think we'll have to learn from some of these things and and see uh, how to apply those uh, uh, in their domain Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very interesting. Um you sound like you sound like my grandfather. He always used to say <laughs> try, just try and keep it simple, John. <laughs> you're a good example of why I love India because the Indians have an ability to mix uh technology and humanity and philosophy all together. <laughs> That's a great great uh great talk. Uh we're running out of time. It's now 9:15. Maybe Roy, you could sort of summarize for us on this question about systemic complexity and and how it gets in the way and just in 2-3 minutes, what would you say uh we should learn from this uh this discussion? Well, listening to uh my steam colleagues, I I would say uh data and life is not a game of perfect uh the our expectations uh, depending on our training probably uh, I, i i think uh to show some of your comments about yours and victors about the notion of we expect too much out of uh, the precision of how we we approach problems these are human problems these are things that are not easily solved and they're constantly evolving uh I I I remain optimistic. I I I'm always fascinated by by listening to people who've been innovating like some of our our panel have been doing uh and the risk taking behavior. Uh education in my my opinion has in general not been a risk taking environment. Maybe for good reason. But uh there is so much advantage to large data sets to to learning I mean, the, the massive amount of data that's accumulating and now can actually be applied in a positive sense is very optimistic for me i think there's there's some there's some great opportunity there uh but that that would be my my observations in general and uh, thank you john for letting us have this uh, this chance thank you very much um thanks everybody i don't want to run out of time we've all allocated 45 minutes to this uh it's always a journey a challenge i should say what frank uh, richter gives us to, to consider and talk about 
uh, as a way to try to uh, solve problems uh, that we're all facing, countries, uh, individuals, couples, schools, politics. And we didn't even talk about Ukraine tonight. Isn't that wonderful? Sure. But it's on our minds. Yeah. <laughs> it's on all of our minds. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll sign off. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you. Best regards. Bye. Bye. Best regards. Bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.